First order of business, quite importantly, is to prepare your buttonholes so that especially at the cuff, there's enough space for the holes in sewing them, what with the lining there. Mark them on. The rule is 35mm above the cuff, 13mm from the edge, 16 between them, and 19mm wide. These are standard measurements for a four buttonhole cuff with a standard tailor's cuff buttons. We know where our top button is, and it's usually 16mm from the edge and 22mm wide. The second button is usually 12 centimeters below it, but that should change depending on the general proportions of the jacket. The lapel button is 38 millimeters below the top edge and 13 millimeters from the edge and usually 25 millimeters wide. Then there's the flower loop, same dimensions except a quarter decimeter below it. Machine the buttonholes, but no need to go further than that until the rest of the jacket is finished. Speaking of, I have waxed about 8 meters of thread for this, so let's see if that lasts. I'm using my normal same coloured polyester thread. Empirically, it'd be a better end product if we were to use silk thread. Silk is stronger, though also thicker, and it's a natural fibre, which is always a neat feature. It's more expensive, but thread-wise we're talking 10 times the price of something that we use about 20 pence worth of. Mold the thread inside of the gorge line and we'll start at the very tip of the seams. Or if you would prefer to start elsewhere, that's fine. Like in my first video, secure the thread and then ladder stitch all the way around to underneath the back lining where we can secure it discreetly. With the thread the same colour as your fabric, you also need to prick stitch along the inside of the break line in order to prevent the top collar fabric from trying to make a break for it when we take off the basting. Start and end securing the thread underneath the melton, then prick stitch along. Don't catch through the melton though because we don't really want to see it except for the prick. Just stitch the fabric and the collar canvas together a little bit under the brake line on the fall. At this point we need to stitch the collar to the jacket. Real quick though, first trim about 2mm of the collar canvas away from underneath the melton. And if you think about it at the moment, there's almost nothing holding it down at the moment, excluding the basting. To begin with, fasten the thread somewhere along the bottom of the melton and we'll sew it to the jacket fabric. We want the majority of the thread to be on the melton and the exact method can vary but if we secure the thread and go into the fabric, angling the needle towards our direction of stitching, coming out about half a centimeter into the melton, coming directly down onto the fabric at the border between that and the collar, then angled in the direction of travel. If you remember, there's silicia or linen, depending on what you chose, 
around the collar, reinforcing it. We'll be catching that while stitching on the collar, but we sure do want to avoid catching any of the lining. Once attached to the jacket, we'll continue stitching up onto the collar. The first, trim the ends of the triangles a bit so that it's as clean as possible. Fell up the edge though. Ordinarily, across the top of the folded bit, you'd cross-stitch over it. However, I have a white tie tail coat, and it's stitched along there in much the same way as we did the melt into the jacket. So, I'm doing that, but it is so much faster to cross-stitch it. Then, fell down the other side. Attached the top collar of the melton along the edge of the fall in the same manner as attaching the stand to the jacket. And, I can't stress enough that we don't want these stitches showing on the front. Once it's all done, check to make sure that it looks and sits correctly. We'll just very simply secure the thread under the sleeve lining and fell across the back lining to the 
other sleeve and moor it underneath the other sleeve. Something I suggest is to increase the density of the stitches at more strained points like the corners and the centre back. That way you might have twice the number of stitches at pressure points. Firstly, don't accidentally sew down the pleat under the sleeve. I did that once, bit of a ball like that was. Once again, we're starting under the sleeve lining and felling down. We want to start at the armhole both times so that if there's too much ease, it'll go under the hem, as opposed to whatever will happen to it if we start at the bottom. As we base down, it's very important that we only stitch the linings together. As I said, when we baste it, we want to be able to get our finger in behind the seam to make sure of that. When we get to the hem, we need to preserve the curtain bit and stitch the two pieces of lining down, then back up the seam. It gets difficult here because we need to keep the six total layers of lining apart, only sewing three together at once. On the whole though, it would be easier to let the seam down or sew the side seam before we put up the hem in the first place. With regard to the vent, we want to start at the top two, like we would if we had double vents. That way, you can change the ease if necessary. At the start of the vent, just fell down and across and then down again. We need to transfer from failing the linings of the lining to the under vent at the same point that we sewed the vent. You might like to reinforce said bit a bit as well. 
So exactly here. I vaguely went over it in the first video, but again, we need to fill the lining to the hem 2 centimeters up behind the folded up hem through one layer so that the lining can move more freely. Starting at the vent, we could either leave the last 2 centimeters freely moving, or, like I am, fill to the corner and curve up to our 2 centimeter point. I stuck a pin in there to keep the strain off the thread for the moment as I pull the lining up out of the way. To clarify, we are only sewing through the folded hem of the fabric and a single layer of the lining. Most tailors have the lining hit the facing 2 centimeters up from the hem, allowing it to be straight along the hem. Then they'll cross stitch over the exposed seam to retard the 2 centimeters of fabric from fraying. I just curve the lining down, making very sure that it doesn't hang out under the jacket like a prolapse anus. And with that image in your head, you won't allow that to happen either. Then we didn't back tack at the bottom when machining the lining to the facing, so I'll fell up a little and hitch them together. And with half the hem done, that's my 8 meters of thread.
time for the painstaking 40 minutes or so of felling the armhole. Don't start on the crown with the ease, either the front or the back or the underarm, and we'll just fell around. When we get to the ease though, we need to stitch it in. In my experience, to fell stitch ease, what we need to do is with our needle, we'll go into the jacket lining and come out our normal three or four millimeters ahead without catching the sleeve line immediately. A millimeter or two ahead of where we came out of the jacket, then take the normal amount of sleeve lining, pulling the stitch tight. Going back into the jacket fabric where we first came out a millimeter or two back and we'll have trapped four to six millimeters of sleeve lining over three or four millimeters of jacket lining. A meter of thread and 25 minutes later. Turn the sleeve out, and we want to start on the underside, i.e. the one that we'll attach the buttons to. Fasten the thread underneath the basted lining and fell down. When we get to the cuff, we'll fell the edge of the lining straight to the sleeve, unlike the hem of the jacket, and there is probably some ease to fell in here too. Then, back up the cuff, at the top, make sure that the undercuff is snug into the lining of the other sleeve. I release the basting here a little to let me work more easily. Up the seam a little to secure it, since the seam wasn't back tight like the vent. Start at the bottom of the facing next to the lining. The best way, balancing resultant speed, is to do a prick stitch along, though only taking a small amount of the opposite side, not unlike doing a pad stitch. At the bottom, we'll sew from the front of the jacket and curve the bottom over our hand in order to preserve the shape. We don't want to pull the stitches too tight, otherwise that'll cause pronounced dimples all along the edge of the jacket which is an effect you may want, but if you want that, it's very necessary that every stitch is equidistant from the edge all the way along. 
creating a straight line. Something subtle across the curve we could do is make sure that the edge is curved properly. We are able to make subtle changes with our permanent stitch, just to make sure that the edge isn't jagged, that it is a continuous uninterrupted curve. We'll prick stitch all the way up to the break point where we'll start doing the same thing from the facing side. When we get to the top of the lapel, stitch into the notch, and at the point that the top collar meets the lapel, just reinforce it a tiny amount with a couple of stitches. Continue then to prick stitch up the collar, then following along the edge. As a right-handed sewer, it's easier to prick stitch starting from the left side of the jacket. Though, if I wanted to double prick stitch the edge, I'd start from the right, because the double prick I found is easiest when the hem is facing away from me. Essentially, we just need to prick stitch the perimeter of the pocket flaps and across the breast pocket. Like the front edge, prick stitch it so that on the underside there is a minimal amount of thread showing. Like I said, like doing a pat stitch. Again, we can subtly alter the curve on the flap to be smoother if it needs be. Now I'm not sure whether we need to iron the jacket before or after doing the buttons, but now is good. We'll start on the lining, but what is very important is that we don't use any steam, and depending on your choice of lining dictates the heat, so keep that in mind. 
all we need to do is go all across the inside of the jacket, flattening the lining, taking out any creasing that will have happened in putting it together, though also sharply creasing the pleats under the armhole, across near the top of the front lining, and the centre back pleat. Also, iron over the shoulder, which is likely most easily done with a ham, and sharply crease the hem as well. And you may like to begin taking out the basting so that you can move the lining more freely. While ironing the lining, we want the main fabric to be flat behind it too. Once it looks good, start on the facings. Use a press cloth, put it on the part that you want to iron, spray it a little with some water, and press it dry. Press all along the front edge. Lay the lapel out flat and press it without pressing the brake line just yet. Fold it over the brake line, and we want to only press the top 10 centimeters or so from the gorge line. It's important that the whole of the brake line isn't pressed over flat because that's not what a bespoke jacket looks like. It's all in the natural roll. That's what the padding on the collar and the lapel is all for. The collar folded more sharply while the padding in the lapel facilitates the rolling wave of fabric. We also want to press the hem flat over the pockets and the body and back shoulders. At this point I'm just naming it all like the picture of the cow with the dotted lines all over it. You know. Try and keep the lining flat underneath as well at this point. A sleeve board would be especially helpful for the sleeve, and we absolutely shouldn't press the brake line flat. When pressing the collar, just lay the collar flat and make sure that we don't cross the border underneath the press cloth. Once we've done the fabric, we might like to touch up the lining again. Iron the whole of the jacket inside and out including, I'm sure, the inside of the sleeve over a sleeve board. Having removed all the basting and done the buttonholes myself now, I, it's clear to me that, yes, we do the ironing afterwards. Given I've gone over buttonholes and where to put them, and already made a joke about padding the runtime for AdSense, I'll leave you to buttoning your jacket. Although, a good rule is to Start with the fourth button, or the last button, and work your way forward from there. Then the front button and the Milanese buttonhole on the lapel last. Recently updated buttonhole video. And, the, and we can finally go through the satisfaction of removing the basting. It has been a long as all hell process of putting this together. And now I look forward to making a better one, likely over next summer. <sighs> Cheers.